I'm going to introduce Jerry, uh, Jerry Crawl. Um, my name's Christy Dustman. I am the VP of the Northeast Region. So Jerry is from Rochester, New York, and has been an enthusiastic member for at least 15 years. He was on the board for five consecutive terms, and during his service on the board, he championed and developed the ACS scholarship program, and he still sits on that, um, on that scholarship uh, committee. He, he and his able partner, Elmer Dustman, who is related to me, uh, organized two national meetings and three regional meetings. So you know what kind of dedication that takes. Jerry and his wife, Karen, opened their expansive garden to a multitude of visitors every year, garden tours of all shapes and sizes. Their garden has been featured in fine gardening and in other publications. Uh, Jerry's expertise with conifers is renowned as he does trial new plants and seeks the best that nurseries and auctions have to offer. And if you have been at a meeting with Jerry, you know that you do not want to try to fight Jerry for a plant. <laughs> uh, he's not content with just planting in the ground. So Jerry has developed a surefire way to keep conifers in frost-free containers over the winter, creating a dimensional environment that showcases dwarf conifers and some companion plants. Studded through the crawl garden are sculptures, benches, chairs, and whimsy, along with many of these uh, container gardens. It is a must-see garden for conifer and garden addicts. So we're honored today to, to learn from Jerry how exactly he does his container rockeries. So take it away. Thank you, Christy. And welcome to uh, people on the East Coast. And uh, good afternoon to people on the East Coast and good morning to people on Mountain and Pacific time. Is this showing up? I got the stuff going up on the top of my slides. I wanna make sure that's not showing. Nope, there's nothing. It looks Okay, perfect. that's fine. My talk is about containers. So what the heck are we looking at? Well, uh, this is what I looked at for the first 15 years we lived here. This was on the Southwest corner of our house. It was a U hedge. It extended all down the west side over here. It was five foot high, five foot across. I had to trim it four, five, six times growing season. It was a bear to maintain. And where it was crowding against the house, it was starting to cause some mold damage. Therefore, you get out of here. And I had them removed. And I did it in the fall so that the ground would have a chance to settle a little bit from freezing and thawing over the winter. They actually didn't pull them out. They cut them off and everything was ground down to about 12 inches. And then we're on the topic, which is going to be about half of my slideshow, the frost-proof ceramics. Before I go any further on what's, this is after I've cleaned up the area. And I planted three Picea ABs gold drift here to hide the air conditioning unit eventually. Uh, I've done a lot of work on the internet with frost proof and the best by far company that will guarantee is Anemies. And if you Google that, you can find out all about them. They are actually a wholesale warehouse uh, in Louisiana. Uh, but uh, they, if you get them on the phone and talk with them, they're very friendly. And it is possible to order from them retail. And the problem is getting a pallet of them delivered, which might be a little costly. But the reason why they're the only ones that really claim to be frost proof, not frost resistant. If you look at all the others that claim to be frost proof, they say frost resistant. These are made from a special clay priority uh, formula from Vietnam riverbeds. It has the highest mineral content of practically any clay in the world. It's extruded 
And again, that's a priority method on how often and how they extrude it, that's squeezing like clay through a sausage grinder. Uh, so you get rid of air spaces and reducing the number of air spaces. And then they're wood fired for two weeks at 1400 degrees Celsius. And that's when the glazes are applied. And over that two weeks, by the end of that time, the material is vitrified. It has become one unit that has flowed into each other. The glaze is now part of the clay that, that, that formed the pot and it's like glass. It will not absorb water into the walls. And that's their frost proof formula. They lose about one out of every three that they fire because of well, everyone's handmade, so there's no machine going here. So there's always that risk when you do it on your own, when you're firing it of a, a material cracking. But the cracking itself, one out of three, gets rid of the ones that weren't really frost proof to begin with. So it's a working formula. So the first thing you do when you get these, because they're gonna be a little pricey, I think these cost me $250 each, but they're almost three feet long and about 18 inches wide. And it's very important to level, level, level. So I laid a flat stone with a good base and leveled the stone. And then I also leveled the pot on the stone. And then you wanna raise the pot up so that there's at least a half inch to an inch of air space under the drain holes. If you just put this in the soil, the drain holes will plug up and your pot will fill with liquid water. And believe me, there's nothing that can take the pressure, uh, lateral pressure of freezing liquid water. Uh, any of you that have grown up on farms, on the old tractors, we sometimes forgot to drain a radiator. And uh, I've seen cast iron engines crack wide open just by the little bit of water in the engine block. So the drainage is very important. And then you can add a few insurance policies. I, I, that's how I think of them, just to guarantee that nothing's gonna happen. So these are some of the materials you'll need, uh, plastic bottles, empty and tightly sealed, screening, scissors. This is lava rock. This is a porous lava and uh, it comes in two sizes, rock and pebbles. I use both and it's very easily available because they use it in barbecues underneath the, the fire to absorb the dripping fat from the barbecuing meats. And then it doesn't burn in the rock, it smokes. So it sends all the smoky flavor back up into the meat. Make sure you have gloves, this stuff is sharp. And the rock garden mix, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In planting these things, keep it simple. Uh, you've all heard the phrase thriller, spiller and filler. Well, in this case, I have two thrillers a little mugo pine called lemon. And this is a Japanese white pine called ogon. This is a creeping juniper, a lime gold. And this is a little alpine fern that loves sun. It's called Chilanthes lanosa. And this is going to be my filler. So that's just a simple planting. And I'll get into how we can arrange these rocks a bit later. And here it is after it's planted and it makes it very attractive. Notice I filled in all the spaces with some of my lava rock and lava pebbles, depending. And then here's one, uh, another one I planted. There's my lime glow creeping juniper the Chilantes, the uh, little fern. By the way, this little fern is called Mighty Tidy. I got it from Plant Delights. And uh, this is one of my favorite 
formal miniatures. This, believe it or not, is a creeping juniper, Juniperus horizontalis. And it's the same species as this critter over, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. Let me go back. Same species as this critter, but this grows nothing like a creeping juniper. This tends to stay in a little formal ball and only grows, I would estimate, uh, if it grows a quarter inch a year, it's a good year's growth. And this is a Japanese white pine. I chose a dwarf and I chose one that had a very irregular growth habit. And there's a reason for that. And that is pruning. Uh, these things grow and I don't want this thing to get out of scale. And I'll have another slide to show you how we can do that later. And there's my third one. I used a Pinus aristata uh, horseman because uh, I love the fact that the needles have the little resin dots. And in midsummer, when people come in for garden tours, I always delight when people come running up. Say, Do you know that one of your conifers has aphids? And I just laugh. And then I give them a little, little, little education in Pinus aristata. It's a lot of fun. Here's the first year. This is the first year I planted it. One year has gone by. And you can see things are beginning to grow well. Here's two years. Doesn't take long for things to grow, does it? The air conditioner is almost hidden. Three, three years. Four years. five years. Now you'll notice that over here, the ogon is gone. And that's because I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like the color. I didn't like the way it grew. And so I replaced it with a little a new arborvitae, Thuya occidentalis called Primo. It's a very irregular growing, slow growing conifer and should be a nice contrast with the uh, golden mugo and the lemon glow or a juniperus horizontalis. What do I look for when I'm looking for conifers to put in these container rockeries? I just think of two things, informal, formal. If it has an informal growth habit, no two plants look alike. Weepers, shrubs, ground hugging, and if you choose an informal plant that doesn't have any formal shape, you're at liberty to draw from this category, this category, and this category. On the other hand, if you go formal, if you want to put in a formal plant, perfect pyramid, a perfect cone, a perfect oval, not only are they hard to prune, uh, you are limited pretty much to this category. And perhaps the bottom half of this category. Uh, the American Conifer Society defines miniature as one inch or less per year. But stop to think, if a plant grows one inch, it really expands two inches because it's growing one inch on the other side too. A lot of us forget that. I learned that lesson the hard way. And so that means after 10 years at a one inch growth rate, that plant could be 20 inches in diameter or high. And uh, that would pretty much take care of your rockery. It'd be the only plant left in it. So I like to go down under a half inch for the formal. So once again, informal allows you to do this, this, or this, because you can easily prune and shape and since no two plants look alike, who's gonna know? And if you go formal, that limits you to the bottom half of the miniature category. And here's some examples. This is Camisiferous juniperoides. Uh, I can't see my label here, so I can't. It's a Hinoki cypress and I bought this about 
eight years ago at the Long Island uh, World Meet, Long Island National Meeting. We stopped at a nursery and he had three or four of these he'd had in a nursery for, uh, at that time, he said 30 years. And I could see they were only about 18 inches, 20 inches in diameter. And so uh, I purchased uh, three of them, two of them, one I gave away in an auction, ACS auction, the other two I gave away to, one I gave to a friend and I kept one. And in eight years I've had, this thing has probably expanded maybe four inches in diameter and maybe has gone up three inches after eight years, no pruning. Here's another one. This is, a, uh, in, this is an informal dwarf, uh, Pinus banksiana. And I chose it because it's very weeping type of prostrate type of growth. And you can easily trim, like if you don't like this one coming out this way, you can go back here and cut it there. Or you can, sometimes I press too hard on this so it reverses. And if you hit it there, so they're easily pruned. Here's a informal intermediate, a kinky, once again. Uh, it tends to form several terminals, is rather bushy. I've maintained it in this area that you see here on the edge of the walkway in the front of the house, which is over here, for 15 years, just by pruning out the excess terminals and growth. This is a little formal Abies lasiocarpa duflan. It's on a standard. Expands maybe a half inch a year, if any. This is a, a informal dwarf, Jacobson, which can grow quite large. I have one in the garden currently, uh, four foot high and about six foot across, but I love the branching structure on it. And it's very informal. If you don't like where a branch is going, clip, and you just send it back. And there's my little Juniperus horizontalis blue pygmy. This is another intermediate uh, blue spruce, Glauca percumbens. Now this uh, you might want to feature in a large single pot. I think it'd make a beautiful specimen in a blue pot or a contrasting color. Uh, hemlock coal is a strict weeper, it's a dwarf. And I have one that's probably four foot across and draping down three feet, but you can go in and prune any of these and keep it contained in your planter. And you can also prune out the top nicely to expose this beautiful branching structure up here. And here's a little formal hemlock in a more shady area uh, called, uh, Abbott's pygmy, and that would be a formal miniature. If this thing grows a sixteenth of an inch, I've had this plant in the ground 10 years, and I can only say it's grown about maybe two inches at the most, bigger. And then let's go back to, uh, this is eight years now, and uh, this is that, Japanese white pine is called Diaset Susan. And I chose it because it's informality and it does have little cones. But I could easily prune it here if this gets too big. This is really thick in here, so I could likely prune out a lot of this. I could shape a lot of this. I've removed up to one third of a plant and it appears not to affect the plant at all. It just goes right on thriving. Here's some examples of other planters I have in the garden. I love color coordination. This is a nice uh, plastic bench. Will never rot, fade. It does get stained with bird droppings, but uh, I have my little lovely spouse go out and wash them before any tours. Uh, but a kind of nice echo with a 
with the uh, frostproof pot. And there's a blue pygmy that was in a piece of pumice, a pumice planter. So I just uh, took the whole thing and plumped it into the top of this pot and that instant rock garden. And then uh, my filler, I have another secondary conifer here, uh, piccolo. This is the balsam fir. And this is uh, white pygmy, uh, Camacypris pacifera, saguaro cypress. And I'm trying to grow a little bit of thyme here. This is on the other side. Notice the color coordination. I even color coordinate the hose. This is Liberec, Picea omerica, Serbian spruce. Uh, this one is hard to find. I got, I bought two of them at an ACS auction and I've looked for them on the internet and I can't find a source for them. So, but there's other uh, cultivars that, that are just as small and nice. And this is a little uh, irregular growing Japanese white pine again called Catherine Elizabeth. And here's a beautiful example of color coordination, my blue rocking gliders, the blue pots. Here's a, here's a, a taxis baccata, buxifolia, the box leaf taxis. And there's a little Picea abies on a standard. And then I even color coordinated the goldfish romping in the sea of Hackanacloa grass called all gold. And we all have this problem. Uh, you buy these nice little dwarfs and so forth, and then you planted them too close together, and then their the bottom branches die out, and so you only have the tops left. And you haven't made up your mind whether you want to remove them or replace them. Removal and replacement is is grueling work, and so I just limb them up because from a distance, you still have a nice vignette. And then it's hard to grow anything in this area because of the root competition from these conifers. And so the frostproof pots work perfectly. And this is a Rex begonia called Griffin. It's one of the larger growing ones. I like the tropical effect. And it's just wonderful that when I first started using Rex begonias, they were pretty pricey, but now a lot of people have discovered them that they can work in the same in dry, shady areas. They can thrive, and they brought the price down on them now to the where they're the same as petunias and any other uh, workhorse annual that we all buy uh, to spice up our gardens. Here's a different view with a different angle of light. And then here's a view going the other way. Again, my blue pots. And this is a nice begonia I found a couple of years ago called canary wings. It's a wax leaf begonia, but it has a yellowish chartreuse color and it flowers instantly all season long. So you get a nice color contrast. Here's a little bit of griffin still showing up here. But what, another reason you might want to do this is because sometimes the trunking on a conifer gets quite interesting. I have no ideas what these are, but I like them. And so I'm encouraging them. I've limbed it up so I get a little more uh, room and make them stand out a little bit better. They remind me a little bit of uh, the Chi Chi on Ginkgo. And uh, they may or may not be, I'm not sure. It's not the graft union, the graft union is down here. So I'm not sure what they are. They're just very interesting. And I found that a lot of the trunking on conifers is the same mature, especially in a dwarf, can get interesting in their own right. And then, uh, of course, I have pots in the garden that I have yet to plant, but I found a perfect place for this beautiful blue frost proof pot here in front of a, a conifer vignette. 
And I don't worry about planting them. If I like the pot where it is, I just set it there. I fill it partially with my uh, special mix. And then if I really have a tour coming or something, I can get a large pot of annuals and just plunk it in there. And so it has like flowers growing off the top. And therefore I can take my time deciding what kind of rockery I wanna put in there and what kind of conifers. So it gives me a more relaxed uh, attitude while I'm waiting for inspiration. Here's another frost proof. I'm trying to grow a Carolina sweetheart red bud in here. And uh, I thought, wow, what's a great place that keeps it away from the rabbits. Ha! That winter, after I planted it, after I took this picture, we had three feet of snow on the ground all over. That's up to about here. And the rabbits got in here and they had a heyday. They ate all of this right down to a single stem. So I put in a new tree. Another interesting use, I had a lot of trees removed two falls ago. Uh, in the front of the house was a large Norway spruce called I Isley Foxtail, which in the 20, 30 years we've lived here and I planted it 30 years ago, uh, was almost 60 feet tall. Obviously way out of, of size and proportion to the house and the roots sucked everything around. It was almost impossible to grow anything up against it. So we cut it off and then I had these, several of these three inch thick, three foot diameter limestone circles uh, cut at a quarry and delivered to Rochester at my favorite stone company and put a blue pot on, frost proof. And I'm going uh, ABs, Ab's Procera Glauca Prostata. It has a beautiful blue color and uh, should look really nice because it's very irregular and tends to weep. And so it should make a nice accent. <clears throat> At the same time, I had eight large locust trees removed in the back. <laughs> they were quite an event. Uh, we had to use a hundred foot crane and they cut them from the top down and lifted them over my neighbor's house into her front yard. And that's where they cut them up. So I had to be very, we're very good friends and I gave her some special plants. And we spent the whole afternoon and morning watching them sitting on her porch, which is over here, uh, enjoying a few glasses of wine and watching the thing in process, quite interesting. Anyway, there's my circles, there's the frostproof pots, and this one I'm growing to, a Taxus Picata green column. And here's another one, I think, uh, I, I can't tell which conifer it is. My wife took these pictures just two weeks ago before we got all the snows. All right, let's get back to the pot. This is what I meant by a pot being a feature in your landscape. Look at this thing, it's perfect. You can see it from several different angles and it takes up this corner. Yes, I could have put a conifer in there, but now I can put several conifers in there. You'll notice there's feet. I finally got feet for all my pots and these raise the pot one inch above the stone. Again, I carefully set a flat stone underneath to keep it off the ground and leveled it so that the pot would be level. I cut the screening to cover up the drain holes. They're about the size of a quarter. And so voles, believe it or not, apparently a, a vole can get through a hole the size of a dime. So obviously this prevents, uh, also we have a pest in the garden called Asian jumping worm. This prevents that from getting into your pot also. And then I use a red lava rock. This is readily available at Home Depot and garden centers. I said they use it in barbecues. And I cover up the screening to make sure it's intact. Make sure you wear gloves 
this stuff is sharp. It's porous. It will absorb water. Uh, it'll almost absorb its own weight in water. Uh, but it won't expand upon freezing. It's that strong and it's very, very sharp. So this ensures very sharp drainage uh, into the drainage holes. This is my first insurance policy besides the pot. This is my second insurance policy. Uh, get some plastic jugs, depending on the size of your container. These are one liter. This is a large container. Tightly seal the cap. I put a little glue on it when I screw it on, waterproof glue, and uh, that adheres and makes sure it's airtight. Now, the thing here is why I'm using them is two reasons. Number one, air compresses. So even if I get some lateral pressure from freezing, these things will take the lateral pressure and compress rather than push out on the sides. And the second reason is this air reservoir uh, acts as an air conditioner for your pot. In other words, in the fall, it's going to take a while for the air inside these things to cool. So instead of your pot going from 70 degrees one day, like we had here last fall, down to 20 the next day, uh, and your pot probably following suit in terms of its temperature, this delays that. It may take two or three days because this air for this air to reach that 20 degree temperature. And in the spring, just the opposite. The air in here is cold. And so in the spring when it warms up, this slows the warming up of your pot just a little bit. It, it avoids extremes in temperature. I barely cover the pots with a lava rock. And then I use the lava pebbles to cover the containers. I try to give myself 15 to 18 inches here for my rock garden soil. The reason I'm using the pebbles is when you put your rock garden soil in, it won't, the lava rock, it will all wash down in between the lava rock. The pebbles prevent that. Uh, it makes a pretty, uh, it'll, it'll infiltrate a bit, but it won't go all the way through. Now making my rockery, I got a big lava rock. Fortunately, I found a surprise source of these. It was temporary though. And I break it up and then you just work like pieces of a crossword puzzle. I put in my rock garden mix, probably two inches from the top wet it down really well. And then I work these like, you just, it's fun. You work it like a crossword puzzle and you try to give yourself spaces. I've got four spaces for plants. And here's the plants. This is uh, my favorite miniature, blue pygmy. There's mother load. Because over here, there's mother load on the ground, so I thought it'd be a nice echo. There's a Japanese white pine, irregular dwarf called Kinpo. I chose this one because it already had dozens of cones. And that's a nice feature. This is an ephedra minima, which I didn't end up using in this pot. I, I forget why I didn't. But that actually is a conifer. So if you really want to show your knowledge of conifers in the garden, uh, find a dry, hot space and put this in. It doesn't get, it gets about five inches tall. It spreads. A common name for it is Mormon tea. It is a conifer and it's much more ancient than even the pines. The next thing, important thing to do is bare root. For, and, uh, Container rockery, you want to get rid of all the organic soil the thing was growing in. So I usually put it in a bucket of water and have a stick and I poke until I get and swish until I get all the organic matter out. The reason you want to do that is because if you just plant it out of the pot with all that organic matter, your plant is going to settle in this container as the organic matter decomposes. 
and you don't want that. So here's what the plant looks like bare rooted. And up here is where it was in the pot. This is called an adventitious root because it was buried that deep, this root formed. And here's the original root flare. So you can see how far that was buried, probably about two inches. So you want to get rid of these because they can girdle the trunk. So snip, off they go. Then I use my rock garden soil. Now this is, uh, you can make your own. Uh, use small pea gravel or turkey grit. Uh, our Home Depot carries it in 50 pound bags. Uh, so you could check yours out. And of course, sand. And I mix them up in a wheelbarrow 50-50. And then I use four parts of my rock garden soil to one part of humus or compost. You want a very lean mixture because what you don't want is structurally is for decomposition to settle your plant. And by keeping a lean mixture of around 20% organic matter, uh, that will solve that problem for you. Uh, you just set the plant in a hole with the bare roots, make sure it's wet, really wet around and wetted. Spread the roots out. I use a little stick so they're nicely spread out. Hold the plant to the height I want it, and then add a couple trowels of my soil, water it, it fills in, ties the roots in, removes air spaces, add a few more trowels of rock garden, poke it around until I reach finally the level I want. And then there it is all planted. This is that Chilanthes lanosa. Uh, this is the straight species. And there's my uh, blue pygmy, and there's the mother load, which will be the spiller. And here's a mother load growing down here, which is probably going to come around and go into there, which I think should look pretty nice. Okay, other containers, real rock. And I was going to just, I had this originally titled just rock or rock containers. But uh, if you Google it, you'll find half the listings are for fiberglass rock containers or foam rock containers. Uh, and I'm using real rock. And this was in the Czech Republic in 2008 when we took an international, ACS took an international trip along, uh, put together by Tom Cox and the British Conifer Society. And this was in the garden of a, a, a man called Baron. He was an ornamental blacksmith. And this goes to show you, you don't have to have lava rock. He's using just like quartz and granite. And here's a close up of that. And also he didn't pay too much attention to the plants used because uh, these plants are easily removed from a container and put somewhere else if you don't like them. Now, what these are, are actually granite watering troughs, uh, probably chiseled out two or three, 400, 500 years ago. They're four inches thick. They're about 18 inches deep and about two foot wide and they have a drain hole. And they were used in pastures uh, to give water for cattle and other grazing animals. So he got and hired a crane, bought a bunch of these. Each one weighed over 2,000 pounds. They're eight foot long. And he put them alongside of his house. Pretty interesting. Beautiful Pendula Bruns, Omerica there. Uh, this is a pumice planter. Actually, it's two pumice planters. I thought I was going to be clever and have a little sedum up here because it was a little more brighter sunshine. But what I love about pumice, gray pumice especially, rocks, are that they absorb water. They're porous. And as the water comes up from the ground and evaporates off the surface, in the shadier parts, it makes the surface cool and wet, 
lichens colonize and then moss. And this can happen in as little time as two to three years and you don't have to put an add moss, it'll come on there naturally. Now, what I didn't count on was rabbits, the bane of my existence. This was beautiful and this is what the rabbits got. So this is only about 18 inches high. So I've got a big rabbit. Here's another pumice planter. I'm growing Tucker's Dwarf, Pinus Banksiana, a very informal type of dwarf. So if I want to prune it here, here, or anywhere as I want, I can take remove up to a third of it with no problem whatsoever. You can already see the mo moss developing down here. And this is a uh, Cydapides verisolata umbrella pine called uh, Sir Happy. And it's a dwarf. But it's obviously going to eventually outgrow this pumice planter it came in. So what I did when I got it, because I really loved the combination, I turned it on its side, got out my chisel and hammer, and I opened up the drain hole until I was at the bottom of the, this hole. Then I got some really gooey soil, and I filled in what I knocked out and then carefully plopped it back on the ground. Now what's gonna happen is the roots will go now, be able to go down through without constriction and into the soil down here. When the trunk gets, where the hole is a six inch hole, when the trunk gets big enough to begin to crowd that, I will just take a chisel on this side and the other side and split it. This is another porous rock freshwater limestone. Uh, this is Picea pungens of blues. The thing you need to be careful of in planting in this is pH. It can often uh, affect the plants. Some conifers don't seem to mind, others do. Another very porous rock is sandstone. Of course, sandstone Sandstone is uh, very hard to do a drilling hole. And so I just use it in a shady place to get that moss effect. Here is a uh, blue pygmy growing in tufa. Tufa is freshwater limestone. The pH off of this is probably close to eight, if not over. Doesn't seem to bother this guy at all. Uh, this is a little reversion. I'll have to have Ted Hildebrandt look at this. This might be an interesting form of this little juniper. So I haven't removed it yet. So Ted, when you come suck sign wood this spring, this winter, uh, take note of this. It's back in the Tufa crevice garden. You can't miss it unless it's under three feet of snow. Tabled rockeries. I saw my first one in the Czech Republic, that 2008 trip. And this was three granite columns supporting a flat piece of rock. And these are all little sedums growing in among it. That was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. I was impressed. So when we went to the botanical gardens near Brno, I saw this. This is a steel pole. This is a tufa, freshwater tufa. And it was actually bolded. There's flanges down here. And it was actually, there's a hole drilled in the tufa. I don't know, maybe halfway or greater. And this would, rock was just set on it. And then they had a little black tube coming up the side inside the rock. And you could just see it coming out here on the top. It won't show in this picture, but it was going drip drip, drip. So this was constantly being gently watered and talk about perfect drainage. I mean, what's there to impede drainage here? And here's a little conifer. I failed to identify it at the time. Uh, they, did, they drilled another planting hole and put in a conifer. And because you got the constant drip, drip, the rock is porous, but it's got a lot of air, well-drained, the conifer's thriving. So I decided to do my own. This was eight years ago. Oh, now more than eight. Yeah, about 
actually about 10 years ago, uh, I purchased an adjacent property and it was all lawn. And this is about a year after I had purchased the property. I already had my walkways in. We just come, I remembered the table gardens from Bruno. And so what I did was take some of the slabs I used down here and I set them on edge. Now, some of these are five foot long. So I made them about three feet off the ground. So that left about two feet to go into the ground. And each one has a bag of sacrete. I also used one going in this plane and the other going in an opposing plane. That forms a triangle, which is the strongest uh, structure you can have. And then with a friend, I put a little mortar here and we put the top on. And there's two ways you can, uh, you can do, do this a little teeny bit off level so the water will drain off. Although I'm reading now that that doesn't really matter and you really don't have to do that. But what I did was get a hammer drill. I had a hammer drill because all my rock work anyways. And so about every six or eight inches, I, I put a hole through this stone. Then I got my lava rock and I just put a little perimeter around the outside. About, uh, lowest ones were about six inches. This was going up to about 12. And I filled that with my rock garden mix. And then I built second tier and did that. By the way, the rock garden mix is a, you can get it uh, pebble, gravel, our turkey grit. Home Depot carries it. They got it in 50 pound bags and you can get a bag of coarse sand and that, mix them together and then four parts of your rock garden soil plus one part of humus or compost. And here it is a couple years ago, nested into a nice colony of Hackamachlora all gold. Some of the plants I put in, uh, this is, sometimes I buy a plant for its name. This is Picea abies Norway spruce stoner. And I think it got that name because it doesn't know how to grow and it looks wild. Uh, the reason for that is like, this is one year's growth. And this is one year's growth. Next year, this might do this, and this might do that. And then it grows at all directions. And so it looks, it's just a, a, a crazy plant high on marijuana going all over the place. This is uh, Abies balsamea uh, piccolo. Notice the moss is already coming out. You can see it here. And this is a uh, little Japanese, uh, my Catherine Elizabeth, again, because of the small cones, look at them. I was a little leery of putting this on there because boy, that's exposed. I mean, it's three foot under here. It's on a thin layer of soil. This has to freeze hard, freeze fast and stay cold. And I didn't, wasn't sure a Japanese white pine would take it, although we're zone six. And I believe this one goes to zone five, this conifer. Uh, it's totally exposed to wind, everything, but it's thriving. Hypertufa gone wild. You got all kinds of hypertufa containers. The key to a good hypertufa container is the amount of sand in the mix. I I think a lot of people try to do hypertufa with too much peat moss or other organic material. Uh, the key to making hypertufa strong is sand. And I'll show you one I've had for almost 25 years in a moment. And here's one, uh, this is the Arborvitae morgan. Any plant you put into hypertufa 
needs to tolerate a little higher pH. This one's not too bad because it just has the container and she used uh, rocks that weren't limestone. However, this one, this is a juniperus uh, communist called gold cone. This is a little hemlock. It is suffering. It's gone chlorotic. And even this one over here, you can see it's gone a little bit chlorotic. And this is because she's not only has it in a hyper tufa container, but this is tufa. And so the pH down here is getting close to eight, very alkaline. And hemlocks don't like that. Uh, they'll do well, just slightly alkaline, but boy, if you get up way above 7.5 to 7.8, they begin to suffer. Here's another part of our garden where an interesting hypertufa container, almost like a table garden. And here the two hemlocks are doing very well. And that's because they only have the hypertufa and she used regular rockery uh, soil in here. And here's a top view. This is coal. And you can see the beautiful trunking structure being exposed. And this is another little, uh, I mean, this might be pygmaea or Abbott's pygmy, I'm not sure. And this Pisces abies is perf push is perfectly happy uh, growing in this hypertufa. So you have to play around a little, see which conifers really work. This is a friend of mine here in Rochester on the edge of his driveway. He had a whole hypertufa garden. Uh, this is not, but I love the way this was done. Three stout legs perched up and the same over here. And there's a hypertufa rabbit. I think the turtle cement, however. And here's a container I planted 25. We've lived in the house 33 years. I planted this 25 years ago. It was a Pyrenees Mugo Pygmaea. And I got it at a nursery the, at, right after a big thunderstorm. And the pot it was in had blown over and rolled halfway across the parking lot. And almost all the soil was gone. And so I picked it up getting out of my truck, took it in. He says, what do you want for it? He said, uh, it's yours for cleaning it up. So I got it free to, besides. But I've had this in this hypertufa container 25 years. The container is two inches thick, two feet long, and about 12 inches wide. Raised up, good drainage. And there's a top view. And I actually raised, I showed you, this used to be roots. These were the two main flare roots. And so roots will become trunk material when exposed. And I kept them apart with a, a stone in between, just to add a bit of interest. Now, how, now what happens here is this gets root bound. And when you go, you can tell, because when you go try to water it, uh, all the water is repelled. In other words, the, the, there's no air spaces or spaces for the water to quickly get into the soil. So how I've kept this in here for 25 years without ever taking it out is I get a six inch masonry drill, a hand drill, uh, don't use a regular drill off 120 volt, you'll have to electrocute yourself, uh, but a hand drill with a battery and a half inch mason's bit, six inches long, and I drill a hole every three or four inches all the way through the pot. I don't refill the holes, I just leave it drilled. And then I water it. Believe me, now the water goes in. And what'll happen is it, it, it prunes some of the roots, they'll grow more smaller roots, and the holes will gradually fill in with these needles and other debris from city atmosphere. And in three or four years, I'll just have to redrill the holes, but it works beautifully. And then I also have it out here for pruning. I, here's what I mean, here's what you can prune. 
this is all a little too much. So I have to decide, do I want this one, this one? I decided to keep this one, so I cut that one off, that one off. I decided to keep this one, but without this one. And you can go all around the plant. It's on a patio. It's easily available. It's a table height. You don't have to bend over. And uh, Elmer, who will be presenting next week, I asked him one time, well, Elmer, when do you prune these things? <laughs> he chuckled and said, whenever you have the pruners in your back pocket. And that's true. I never go out in the garden without pruners in my back pocket. This is in a tufa. And this is Texas Bacata Fastigiet. I don't recall which one it is. But this is a nice little plant. You can grow in a hypertufa container. It gets about half sun. And I like this one. It, I got it from Plant Delights. It's uh, Eurebia divericata, uh, white's wood aster. But this is a, a little cultivar called Tiny Heine. And what I fell in love with was the dimorphism of the flowering vegetative growth and the non-flowering. This is growth that has, won't flower this year, but will next year. And next year it will do that. And then this will go non-flowering and do this. Very interesting. And finale, for my finale, and it's autumn. This is my table garden, looking back into the garden. Uh, this is a maple called fairy hair. I love it. This is the most gorgeous, translucent. It looks delicate, but it's, it's fairly rugged. And here's the table garden. This is uh, blueberries. You take a nice fall color. And that's it. So I'm going to end the slideshow. Does anyone have any questions? You're welcome to put questions in the chat. Uh, I goofed here. Thank you very much, Jerry. That was really interesting. Yeah, I'm Did trying to get back to the, the program here. It's a 125, so it has to be this one. There's a couple of compliments to you, Jerry. Okay. How do you water your pots? Someone is asking, uh, how do you water the different pots? Okay, uh, I generally nature provides, I, my formula is one inch a week. So if we get a one inch rainstorm, uh, I don't water them that week. If we get a half inch, I put on about a, a half inch of water uh, to make sure it's always once a week. Now that depends on New Year. A planter is. If you've just planted it, yes, you need to keep your eye on it because it can dry up very quickly. But the beauty of uh, the mixes I gave you and the buildup is that lava rock is porous and it will absorb its own weight in water. And so you have a capillary, eventually, it'll take a year or two, you'll have a capillary feed from that porous lava rock into your rock garden mix. And I've not had a problem uh, with these drying out. Every once in a while, I'll forget to water them, but they seem to get along fine. Thank you. The next question is, in selecting material for your rock garden, do you need to purchase plant materials a zone lower uh, to consider wind chill on your ex on the exposed pot. No. <laughs> okay. I never. That's one thing. That's why I went frost proof. 
if you get frost resistant, yes, you've got to keep water off of them in the winter. Uh, I just let them do the same thing as a plant in the ground. I don't protect them at all. Uh, and I said, uh, if you get a plant a zone colder uh, than your zone, they should do very well in a planter. So are you saying that you do that you do usually uh, get plants that can so you're a zone six. So do you would you put a zone six plant in a planter or would you always go with the zone five? You that's... never know. Okay. And the beauty of having a plant is a zone six plant in a zone six. Uh as I said, I was surprised at that Japanese white pine making it on that table garden. It's thriving. Yeah. And we've had, temp last winter, we had a minus 10 and a minus 12. And it's been the same this winter. And I have not had any wind burn or scorch or sun scorch or anything uh, develop on them. Okay. Next question, how much space are you gardening on? I think someone is maybe curious how big your garden is. Particularly I have, as you mentioned buying your neighbor's house. Yeah, I have a short acre. <laughs> An acre is 42 plus square feet. And I have, according to my assessment, uh, about 38,000 square feet. So I have almost an acre, not quite. I was going to buy another property to make it an acre, but I changed my mind and hit my, instead I let my niece live on that right next door to us because she's my garden keeper when Karen and I take off to Florida, Jamaica, or wherever we go in the winter. Perfect. Uh, people are thanking you for your presentation, your knowledge, experience. Uh, someone's asking if you cover any of the container pots during hard winter weather. No. I never have. Okay. I, I don't, for one thing, that's a lot of extra work. And I'm getting up there. And so the less work I have to do. And uh, I, I said I've never covered the pots. Uh, I suppose you could if you want to, but then I think you're giving the pots a little greenhouse effect and you might actually cause more damage mm. than good. Like when do you take it off in the spring and how hot is it going to be on a spring day in full sunshine? If you used even a brown like burlap, you're going to raise the temperature inside. That's, it's called a greenhouse effect. And you might start the plants pushing bud too early. So when you remove it, you all of a sudden get a 26 degree night. All those buds are gone. Okay. Question about how do you fertilize and what types of fertilizer? Okay. Uh, fertilization defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do. You don't want things to grow rapidly or uncharacteristically. So that's where the mix comes in. As I said, it's only 20% organic matter. Now, once the roots get down into the lava rock, fertility will not be a problem. I.e., what happens on volcanic islands after a volcanic explosion? Within 10 years, it's covered by what? In tropical areas. A jungle. Lava rock has all the nutrients it needs, but it's gonna take a few years for the roots to get down in there. So what I use is uh, if your plant looks a little chlorotic, that means it's probably not getting enough nitrogen. That's the only nutrient I've had to fertilize with. And what I do is just uh, you go to a garden center and I get a high nitrogen liquid for house plants. And in a watering can, I might put four or five drops and I water the plant as well. I mostly water the plant. And the needles will absorb through the stoma the nitrogen they need. And it's a quick fix. 
and you're not over fertilizing the plant crop causing uncharacteristic growth. Someone is wondering what the name of the large begonia was Griffin. that we showed. Griffin. 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 G-R-Y-P-H-O-N. Could you give your rock garden soil recipe again? Okay. 50-50 uh, uh, turkey grit or that's real jagged type of material or pebble gravel, pebble, let's call it pebble gravel, pea gravel, I'm sorry, pea gravel. I mix them up in my wheelbarrow 50-50, in other words, one pail of, of uh, pea gravel and one pail of coarse sand. Make sure you get coarse sand, not play sand. You want the coarsest sand you can find. And then you mix it 50-50 and then to make your uh, mix, use four parts of that to one part compost or humus. So it's 20% humus or compost. And what that does, it keeps the structure. In other words, your soil will not settle as the organic material decays. And uh, it's just a very stable mix and works really well. Excellent. Um, Someone is asking, what is the name? You had mentioned that there was an ancient conifer that. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it's called uh, Mormon tea. And its scientific name is Ephedra minima. There's no cultivar. Ephedra minima is the miniaturized form of a Mormon tea major which grows 10 feet by 10 feet in the, in the deserts of Utah. Awesome. And it, it is a conifer. You could, you'll, if it is happy, hot and dry, uh, you'll get little teeny like juniper berries uh, growing on it. And those awesome. are naked seeds, which defines a conifer. So it's one of the most primitive, probably one of the first conifers to develop uh, from the mosses uh, on the planet. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, again, more uh, comments, compliments. Um, you've already answered questions about fertilizing. Someone's asking how much sunshade does your Japanese maple fairy hair tree get? All right, it gets, doesn't get early morning sun, but about mid morning, it gets full sun all through noon. But in the afternoon, late afternoon, like five or six o'clock, it goes into shade. And it's protected on the uh, west and the north and the south. Uh, by surrounding vegetation, but it is rather exposed uh, to the west or south, I'm sorry, rather exposed to the south. All right, thank you. Uh, here's, here's a wonderful compliment. Best ACS program I have seen yet, says someone. Oh, whoa. <laughs> wow. um, can you announce an online source for quality fiberglass rock troughs no i don't use fiberglass troughs because i find that they are not uh stable and unless they're really good quality fiberglass which i think he may be referring to uh they're going to fall apart and okay. especially if they're painted uh, if they're painted to look like a fiberglass uh, rock or a container. Uh, the paint does not adhere well to fiberglass over a few years. So I don't even bother. I tried foam, I've tried fiberglass, and after four or five years, they're just temporary holding things as far as I'm concerned. Whereas a frostproof pottery will last forever. Yeah. Unless somebody comes along with a sledgehammer. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, do you have any source for hypertufa troughs? We have a couple artisans. What I would recommend is you must have uh, some garden shows or garden things where you have people come, vendors come in. We have two or three here in Rochester every year and you'll find the uh, Hypertufa people and you can ask them how much sand they put in because I think that's a critical thing. It should probably be at least 20% uh, sand okay. as well. And someone is asking, do you actually make Hypertufa containers um, in that do you have a recipe for it? No, I don't. Okay. It's, it's a little side thing. I did make some Hypertufa mushrooms, uh, just as ornaments in the garden, but I, I, I've never made a trough. Okay. All right. I think that is the last question. Um, I just posted that next Saturday at one o'clock, there'll be another Zoom presentation and Elmer Dustman will be talking about his aesthetic pruning of one of Jerry's junipers. Uh, I don't think you showed it in the talk today, but we'll be talking about a well-loved juniper. <laughs> so that is it. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. And thanks, everybody.